Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to MTA Talks. Hey, Azbai. Assalamu alaikum. It's, it's been a minute. I think, I think the last time that we met, I, you probably don't even remember, was when we were filming Kids Space God Summit Special yes. for children. We had the Barber of the Bear. We had the studio downstairs. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah, the kids still, they if they see me walking to and from the mosque, oh, you're that guy that was <laughs> talking to the teddy bear. And I said, yeah, that was me. That sounds Thanks like a to great way to ahead. introduce you. Yeah. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, it's, it's a fitting way that we, the last time we met, we were filming something for children. Because today we are here, and I've called you today, on MTA Talks to speak about the promised Messiah, alayhi salam. Obviously, it is the promised Messiah day. We know about the prophecy. We know about the great manifestation of what he, what he was. But today we want to know about the human side of that prophet. So how was he as a father, as a husband? But we're going to start with how he was as a child. Mm. Today, children watch Kids Space. They're on their screens. They go outside and they play football and games on the street. But a child, let's say over 100 years ago, didn't really have access, obviously not to screens at all. And even when it came to other commodities, they were hard to come by. So the promised Messiah alayhi salam, before his claim, before really anybody even knew of him as an adult, was of course a youngster like everybody else. So he asked by what was he like? When we speak about the promised Messiah alayhi salam as a child, as a youngster, who are we talking about? That's a wonderful uh, point to start this discussion from because the fact is that the way a person is when they are a child hmm. is a real reflection of their inherent nature. Right. Because adults, they can put on a persona, they hmm. can sort of act, you know, when children they're in public. Yeah. But children are innocent. They right. are what they are. Hmm. So when you look at somebody's mannerisms in childhood, that demonstrates a true f reflection of what they are. Because children don't act, they are what they are. And that adds to the miracle of these people, mm. how Allah the Almighty chooses someone and then helps them grow under his own care. And the promised Messiah so, alayhi salatu was I'm like assuming that. what you're trying to tell me is that obviously he was and is the promised Messiah alayhi salam. Are you trying to tell me that he was kind of religious, spiritual, from day one, from a young age? Well, yes. In, he did have this natural inclination towards God. Okay. And he, for example, um, there's a very beautiful incident from his childhood where he was playing with another child. Right. And you know, what do children usually talk about? Games and, you know, random things. Yeah. But this child, who was soon to grow up to be the prophet of God and who he was didn't going know, to he, he didn't know he was going to guide the whole of humanity as a 10 11 year old child perhaps even younger than that but not much older he's telling that other child that pray for me that Allah the almighty enables me to feel the blessings of prayer okay pray so that Allah <laughs> enables me to pray and worship in the way that he wants me to so this is the, these are the sentiments of a child when you hear children they're thinking about the things. Hey, did you watch football last night? Yeah. Have you played this game? What was your score? And, and these are the kinds of things they're probably concerned about. So for yeah. the promise of Sayyid alayhi salam, as a child, to tell, not even an adult, because like you said, they, if they tell an adult, they might want to give an impression, hey, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a certain way. But if they're telling a child, they know they're not going to get anything out of it. They're not going to get candies. They're not going to get money. Yeah. They're just telling that child because that's what they feel. That's what they feel. And what the promise of Sayyid alayhi salam really, really cared about at that moment was... I want to feel that closeness to God in my prayers. Yeah, so that's yeah. what you're, that's the promise of Sayyid Islam yeah. as a child. Yeah, and he, unlike other children, he he enjoyed his time in seclusion where he mm. would reflect over the okay. universe and over Allah and think about these things, these deeper things. And um, there, he would he would spend a lot of time reading. Um, and uh, okay. many people would come and say. Uh, to the father of the promised Messiah al Islam that uh, Mirza Sahib, we've seen your elder son, Mirza mm. Ghulam Qadir Sahib, right. but we've never seen your younger son. Oh, and, 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 and they would say, and he would respond by saying, yes, he's probably rolled up in a prayer mat somewhere in the mosque. Okay. Uh, you'll find him there. But reading, reading, you said reading, like what yeah. kind of stuff? Uh, he, he loved f the Holy Quran, okay. mostly. It's narrated his... Uh, eldest son as Mirza Sultan Ahmed Sahib says that the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, this is before he became a prophet before he was known to anybody yeah, he had a copy of the Holy Quran okay. a small pocket sized Quran and he says that he would continuously read that and he would take notes on it he would highlight oh. sections and it's, he says that I can say without exaggeration mm. that the promised Messiah must have read that Quran 
at least 10,000 times without exaggeration. It sounds really profound to me because nowadays youngsters look towards influencers. Hey, my role model is doing this. Let me copy that. He, he is wearing this. I'm going to get get a pair of shoes like that too. They're doing this. Let me let me do that too. There's a trend going on. Let's mm -hmm. film that. What could have possibly inspired the promised Messiah as a child to sing I'm going to pick up a Quran. I'm going to go and do something spiritual. It just it makes me wonder because you've mentioned some of his brothers I'm assuming they must have also been religious Muslim as well but it sounds like he was a lot more or a little bit more inclined to doing it and doing it in seclusion as you said mm. what could have been happening well I don't know what could have been going through his mind at that time but what I know what we can all be certain about is that Allah the Almighty had fashioned his soul in such a way right. that he found his comfort in Allah Okay. And in reading the words of Allah and so, in growing closer hmm. to Allah the Almighty. And the, and the reason he did that was because he felt comfort and he enjoyed those things. And these are the things which then later became the building blocks of his character and his personality. And then his personality shone all the more after and oh, shined. It almost sounded like he was born to do this, although he did not but know it. Yet. Well, that's the miracle. <laughs> that is exactly the miracle. When right. Allah the Almighty mm. chooses these people who are soon to become mm. the guides for humanity, right. the, the seed is sown very early from the very beginning, and then Allah the Almighty protects that, that, that small it. sapling, and then it grows and it flourishes and it becomes Got a it. huge tree. And then other people find shade under that tree. You've spoken about the Prophet childhood, and that's something that's quite intriguing to hear about and I remember and this is by no it actually, this actually is a coincidence because I remember I think it must have been 2016 where I was sitting at the car for the first time ever and I had a book and I've never seen that book again up until like a few days ago someone handed me this book they said hey read this book it's about the promised messiah alayhi islam and it was a small book I think it was like a 50 60 odd pages right it was written by Hazrat Mawli Abdul Karim Sial Kurti Sahib that's one thing I remember and he accounts how he, being very close to the Promised Messiah Islam, witnessed him as a husband, as a father, and so many more things, but really behind the scenes. And that mm. book has stuck with me since that day. So whenever someone speaks to me about who the Promised Messiah Islam was, that rings a bell. I'm like, that's the book. I remember everything from there. Mm. And then fast forward 2024, a couple of weeks ago, I'm thinking we need to do something about the Promised Messiah Islam day is coming up. And I want to talk about his family's life, his family side, because I remembered that book. And I don't know why we decided we'd call you on. All right. And later on, I find out that by the grace of Allah, you have actually translated that book into English, into a kind of repurposed book just recently. And that book is really special. I remember translating that during lockdown okay. um, when we were at home, working from home and, you know, the children were home and you would become very easily aggravated by the children jumping <laughs> around in the house. Yeah. You're trying to do your work and they're running here and about. And when I started translating that book, I will, I will tell my children about it. That book had such a profound effect on me that it changed me as a person because that book demonstrated how the promised Messiah was at home. And the special aspect of that book is that Hazrat Malvi Abdul Karim Sahib, he says himself mm. that I have had the opportunity to be very close to the promised Messiah. He, in a way, Didn't he, he used live to above do, him? Yes. So if you've been to Masjid Mubarak in Qadian, you walk up the stairs mm. and you turn left and that will lead you to Dalan, Hazrat Ammajan. But if you go up to the roof of Masjid Mubarak, there is a Shah Nasheen there where the Promised Messiah used to sit and have his uh, okay. assembly. He would talk to his companions. So right on the right side of that, there is a room okay. to the top. And that's where Hazrat Mawlvi so Sahib used to live. He kind of lived in the same complex. He used, to live, in this, he used to live in Darul Masih. As far as I remember, the book was something like, because the walls were not as concrete as you get today. So you could always kind of get a feel of what's going on in the houses, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the rooms, and you could probably hear things. And obviously he observed things as well, because yeah. he was not only a companion, but he actually sort of served in a capacity as well, right? Yeah, and that's exactly what he says in the book, that I have had the opportunity to see the promised Messiah in his informal moments. Um, in a way, he used to do many of the tasks that a private secretary would do. Okay. The Promised Messiah would give him work to send correspondence. Okay. Uh, he would translate sections of the Promised okay. Messiah's books from per Arabic to Persian and other things. So he says that 
in the book that I have seen the promised Messiah in his informal moments, sitting in, alone in a room, interacting with his children, interacting with wow. people of the household, and most other people haven't had that opportunity. So he really saw him behind the and, scenes, to put it. Yeah, and, and, and the important point that he notes there, absolutely behind the scenes, and he says that the real reflection of a man's character shines when you see him in a setting where other people are not watching him. So that is how he is naturally Okay. When there's no one else to see him. This is, this so is he's powerful mentioned, because this is where, where I really want to be able to bring this to light. He saw the promised Messiah, alayhi islam, as a father, as a husband. And like you've already mentioned, being a father, especially in lockdown, can become difficult. Yeah. And for the average person, it's very easy to say, I'm going to be a good husband, I'm going to be a good father. But in the moment, can you actually do it? Are you able to not lose your temper, for example? Are you able to... You know, keep everything in order. Are you able to keep calm? Mm. Are you able to show them that you don't just say that you believe in God, but you actually do believe in God through your own actions? Tell us how the Prophet Islam actually did this as a father, as a husband. How did he do that? Well, let's take the example. We're talking about lockdown and being easily aggravated by yeah. the children, right? Trying to do your work, office work at home, and the children are running around. And you, you eventually it comes to a point where you say, get out, lock the door, <laughs> let me do my work. Lock down and lock the door. So <laughs> the promised Messiah, alayhi salatu as yeah. it Molvi Saab mentions, that the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, was accustomed to sitting in his room quietly with the door locked. And yeah. he would do his writing work mm. in the room, or he would do different kinds of, or he would be reflecting or writing. So one day he was sitting in his room, I was sitting with him too, and one of his children came hurriedly to the door and started banging the door and knocking and yelling and screaming that, Abba, Abba, Father, open the door, open the door. Okay. The promised Messiah alayhi salam, stood up in a very dignified manner, went over th to the door, unlocked the door, opened the door. The child didn't even walk in. Okay. He stuck his head in, <laughs> left, right, and then just ran off. <laughs> The promised okay. Messiah closed the door, locked it, and sat down again. Got to work. Two minutes, and he started working. And he was working on something really important at and the you know, time, trying of, to... It kind of is difficult, especially when you're yeah. writing or thinking. Yeah, you, you have a train, train of, of thought. thought. Exactly. Like, oh, where was I? Right? <laughs> yeah, so he was writing something, and it was very important. Two minutes later, the child came back, and he was screaming and started banging the door and pushing the door. Okay. Abba, Abba, open the door, open the door. The promised Messiah got up opened the door again. This time the child stuck his head in again. He murmured a few words <laughs> and then ran off again. <laughs> and the promised Messiah then locked the door, sat down again. And Hazrat Mulvi Sahib says that without exaggeration, Allah is my witness, mm. that I saw this take place literally 20 times. The child must have yeah. come back 20 times within, the, within a succession of two to three minutes. And every single time the promised Messiah would get up, open the door, the child would stick his head in and say nothing and run off. And the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, had such composure and love and kindness that he did not even say to the child that for God, the 15th time, yeah. at, at least he could Cut have said, yeah. what do you want? Mm -hmm. What do yeah. you want from me? Tell me what you want. Right, right, right. He didn't even say that. Wow. And he would just come down and sit do down. And that's what I'm talking about. That, that, that control over yourself, over your emotions. Alhamdulillah, that... <laughs> really shows how the promised Messiah Islam, had an immense amount of patience and he did that I think it seems like he really had this conscious mind that he didn't want to push his children away and also I've read a lot about the promised Messiah Islam where he reminds parents not to fall into shirk and what, mm. and I, what I particularly remember reading is the promised Messiah Islam saying do not rebuke or physically hit your children every time they do something wrong so that you feel in like fact, you never, yeah. not every time, never, yeah, never ever, hit them. Never yeah, absolutely. It. So that you assume that you are God and that, yeah. that you have control. So yeah. it's easy to say that, but he displayed that at every single yeah. occasion. That's powerful because that allows a child to be really comfortable with their parents. Yeah. So I think that's vital in this, this age where parents need to be the kind of people that can be open to their children. Yeah. They need to be the kinds of people where a child knows my father, my mother won't rebuke me straight away because then if, if they're going to rebuke me over a small thing, if, I, if I'm coming to them about a, a difficult question or yeah. something I'm feeling afraid to open up about, how am I going to do it? Yeah. So I think the promise of Saturday Islam has given us a really great example here that us as parents, the calmer we are, the more open we are with our children, yeah. it will be very easy for them to come to speak and speak to us about things that matter. 
Yeah. And that's one way to do it. Yeah, you know, in reality, Kamar, most of 99.9% of the time when a ch- when a father or a mother is rebuking their child or getting upset at them, when you think about it in hindsight, it's your own frustrations from the day which you then let out on your children. Mostly. Yeah, and it's easier said than done to not do that. And for the promised Messiah, alayhi salatu was he didn't have an easy life. He had hundreds of issues where people were attacking him mm-hmm. and writing about him. And he had this huge task from Allah the Almighty. Him, out of all people, had the right to tell his children and his family that, look, yeah. this is this is a God, div- a divine institution. Mm-hmm. I need my time to do my work. Don't disturb he me. Was, but he never he did that. He was unwell as well, right? Um, yeah. I mean, migraines, I think illnesses in the stomach. Yeah. Uh, he would obviously carry on his work while doing this. And of course, in his house, he's not just a, a father, but he has wives. Yeah. And there's other people in the house. In fact, you've already mentioned it's like a kind of a bigger house. Other people are living around as well. There's yeah. workers. And when he was ill or unwell, would things become more difficult? And how would he react to that? He would be lying in his room. Sometimes he would have serious migraines. Hmm. And he would be lying in his room alone, without any attendance, nobody. He would never demand that people should bring him food or something uh, to take care of him. You know, when people get mm. ill, they get cranky and they expect special treatment. The promised Messiah was so different from that. Uh, Hazrat Molvi Sahib says that he would be lying in his room alone and sometimes the people around the house, yeah. the workers and the attendants, they yeah. would be making noise. The women would be talking loudly. Sometimes uh, Hazrat Molvi Sahib says that the workers in the house, sometimes they would be... F- arguing with one another yeah. about certain petty issues. Yeah. And once the prom- uh, Hazrat Mulvi Sahib said to the Promised Messiah that, Hazur, doesn't this add to your, aggravate your headache? And he said, well, yes, when they, when they quiet down, it does give me comfort. Mm. And he said, then Hazur, why don't you tell them? Right, tell them know? once sternly to stay quiet and give me some peace. And uh, the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, how beautiful he was. He said, Mulvi Sahib, you tell them in a gentle manner. I don't have the heart to say anything to them. So he was that gentle and that calm. I mean, I have a bit of a migraine right now, admittedly. (laughs) And I know that when it gets severe, because the problem is Messiah, alayhi salam, it used to get quite severe. And especially when you've got that workload, to not even so much as say, keep it down a little bit. It takes a lot of power. And there must have been a reason why he was doing all of this. And and the more I reflect on it, it caused to me a a, a recollection as well, where... Mm you probably can tell us better because the workers in his house weren't the most affluent as well sometimes things would go missing sometimes out of just reasons and today if that happened in someone's house someone something goes missing people get frustrated they get angry how did the promise of islam react when people begin to grow in their spirituality and in their in their righteousness sometimes that righteousness can become a means of displaying condescending behavior. Okay. Sometimes inadvertently. What do you mean? So sometimes when you reach a level, people will start thinking that, you know, I'm a righteous person and okay. they'll they'll start believing subconsciously that they are at a higher oh, right, moral right, right. pedestal okay. than others. So they now have the right to lecture other people about right, right and wrong. Okay. Right? And they may be lecturing people about the right things. The right thing to do. Yeah. But it's one thing to do that and then it's another thing to be righteous and saintly and not consider yourself to be at a higher moral ground than others okay. there is a beautiful incident of, of, of a worker from the house of the promised messiah alayhi salam, who stole a bag of rice a, a sack of rice some 10 kilos or something 15 kilos and um wow. she hid the bag under her, the sack under her chadar or whatever, mm. and she was trying to, you know, somebody noticed, and then all of the people came together and they started rebuking her, and they said, how dare you steal from the home of the promised Messiah? Um, you know, the person who gives you, you know, your wages and everything, and you have, how how can you do this? Right. The promised Messiah, and in a way they were right. She shouldn't have been stealing. She shouldn't have been stealing. They caught her doing something wrong, and then they started hounding her for it. The promised Messiah alayhi salam, happened to be walking by okay. while that thing was going okay. on. And he heard the hue and cry and he said, what's going on? And then they explained everything to him. And it just, it gives me goosebumps even now just to say it and think about it and reflect over it. The promised Messiah alayhi salatu was salam, said so lovingly that leave her. She's in need. Hmm. Give her the rice wow. and don't shame her. Wow. She's in need. 
That's and powerful. she and 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 he said that you of all of you people, instead of accusing her, should remember that Allah covers your faults as well. So you should cover her fault as well. Wow. And I, so here we've got one thing where it's about not shaming, not rebuking straight away. But I, I and I and I might correct me from wrong. I remember something of the recollection, whether it was this incident or in the future at some point, he would actually then go, make sure to go the extra mile. That okay, this person's taking rice. This means that they probably don't have food at home. Mm. So he actually would take measures, extra special measures, to make sure that his workers were not having to face that situation. And if he found out that this was the case, like this was the case, mm. rather than rebuking that person, he would be very concerned. Yeah. That, oh, we need to help these people. Yeah. And I think this allows, again, as coming back to a person who's in a household, to create an environment where. Uh, someone doesn't feel like they have to hide things from you mm. and they would feel like okay if I need something I can just go and ask them I can go yeah. and tell them and that person will be very very willing to help yeah. and I feel like this is again something really powerful that we can learn from the promise Messiah salam. if anything it, the promised Messiah salam, was always ready to help mm. if anything it was out of the weakness of those people who underestimated the promised Messiah and wouldn't come to him for help. Yeah. Otherwise, whenever they would, right. he was always there for them. There's an incident where village women would mm. come and knock the door of the promised Messiah yeah. and say, we need medicine for our children. Right. And the promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, would, you know, s start uh, dispensing that medicine, as it Maulvi Sahib. Why did they come to medicine for him, from, to him? Well, because... There, w there was no hospital in the oh, area right, of course. Yeah. and uh, these medicines were very expensive. Okay, I got it. Um, so the promised Messiah would keep a stock of those medicines. One time it's narrated that Hazrat Mulvi Sahib saw the promised Messiah Islam. these very simple w village ladies, uh, they would come and they were asking the promised Messiah for medicine and they were showing their children. There were so many people there, a huge crowd. Mm. And one by uh, Hazrat Mulvi Sahib says that I saw the promised Messiah Islam standing straight as if an Englishman on duty. And he was vigilant and he was dispensing medicines to every person asking them their needs. And I saw that this continued for like three hours. Wow. And at that time, the promised Messiah had called me for some urgent work because he was working on an exposition which okay. I needed to uh, translate or he needed to give me instructions. And he says, I v witnessed this for three hours. And when finally everybody had been served, I said to the promised Messiah that, Hazur, this is a great inconvenience for you. This is taking away from your religious duties. Mm. And the promised Messiah salatu wasalam, said that this is also a religious work. And it's my duty. We should never underestimate the importance of doing this work because these are poor people. They can't afford this medicine. There's no hospital in the area. And in fact, I order this medicine from far places, far off places and keep them with me so that when the wow. time comes, I can give them that it, medicine. It really sounds like it's something that maybe you, he didn't need to do. But he yeah. did it anyway. Yeah. He really went out of his way. That's what it feels like to me. It out sounds of his like love for humanity. It's not like you can just order it on Amazon Prime and it's going to come the next day. It's, it sounds like a really arduous, difficult task, especially bearing in mind that he himself was not that well. Yeah. So that's, again, just something so powerful and I'm sure people will benefit from that. So we've, we've heard a lot about the Promised Salah Islam now as a child, as a father, how he was with his companions, with the people in the village and with some of the workers in his house. He also married a few times. We, we heard a little bit about it already. Uh, as someone today in the 21st century, we live in a time where divorce rates are quite high. Not only are divorce rates high, but even if there isn't divorces, there's a lot of problems within marriage. And we're not just talking about non-Muslims. This is happening in Muslim societies as well. What kind of beautiful examples did the Promised Messiah Islam show us which can really help us today. So the manner in which he uh, would treat his wife with such love and care is just exemplary. Once it's narrated that the promised Messiah was in, um, was, uh, in Amritsar for yeah. his debate against Abdullah Atam, oh, okay. a very famous yes. uh, debate. And he, again, he was suffering with migraine at that time. Um, and it is narrated that... Uh, Munshi Abdul Haq Saib came and met the Promised Messiah al -Islam, and said that Huzur, Who's that? Um, a companion of the Promised right. Messiah al -Islam, came and met right. him right. and right. other companions right. were there as well to okay. see him and he said Huzur, 
this headache that you have a lot of it has to do with you not taking care of your health like eating you're, food you're, you're just not eating properly you you need to make sure that a proper a good food with nutrients right. special right. food is prepared for you which gives you strength because okay. you're exerting your mental capacities and doing academic work that it really takes a strain on your mind yeah and uh, Hazur said that yes, when she said I have mentioned this to my wife and the the women a few times, <laughs> that if they can make some special food that would you know give me strength, right, uh, and it helps with the headache as well. But you know, the women they're busy with their own things. He was they a, tend was to he a diabetic, the Prophet of Islam. Yes, he did. He suffered from uh, 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 diabetes. So as that well. definitely requires some kind of dietary. Yeah. So, uh, needs. so uh, yeah, you you feel a, a low blood sugar level. You need to eat to gain strength. And the promised Messiah said very casually and lovingly that as I've mentioned this a few times when she said, but the women, they're busy with their own chores and tasks and so they tend to forget. And Hazrat Munshi Sahib said, he, he was a very saintly man and a very righteous man. He wasn't a very rough person. Right. But even he, he said to the promised Messiah, well, that's because Huzur, the reason they don't do that is because you don't tell them sternly enough. Okay. In my household, I've instructed the my wife that this is what I need at this time and I make sure that she provides that at the specific time and if so, there is any negligence, <laughs> I will make them answer so why they haven't... being a man? Yeah, you so have to, to be a man. <laughs> and Hazrat Malvi Abdul Karim Sahib said that I felt so happy that I had been thinking this for such a long time that yes, Hazur, you need to be stricter. Someone's finally said you it. You need to be strict and someone's finally said it. So I said, Hazur, Munshi Sahib is right. Hmm, back you should be yeah. stern and tell the women to. And Hazrat Malvi Sahib says that the promised Messiah turned to me. He smiled yeah. with a very gentle smile and he said, Malvi Sahib, our friends shouldn't be like this. Uh -huh. And he says, Hazrat Malvi Sahib says that I am a very sensitive person and at that time I used to feel you know that I've been embarrassed in front of this whole gathering and I felt such a level of embarrassment for saying that thing that but then I realized that these are the high levels of spirituality that we all need to work towards so being a man doesn't mean to be rough and mean and uh, stern and rule with the stick right so yeah. being a true man is to be kind and compassionate like the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam. And, and the example that we find in his, li in his life is, is just unparalleled. I mean, you, again, like I said, it's so easy to make the claim, I will be a good husband, I will be a good father, etc., etc. But time and time again, he's not just saying it, he's actually doing it. Yeah. And, and it keeps reminding me, because when you tell a child something and you just say it, it, it has a certain level of an impact. But these things that you've told me about him, being very patient and doing it in a certain way, it it must tell the children at home that in, in you know his own children that clearly he must believe in God because if he didn't believe in God and he only said it, he would have lost his temper, he would have got frustrated because he wouldn't actually have had that faith that hey God is there for me. But because he's actually being patient and he's being really calm and reflective, clearly he is actually clinging his hopes onto something else yeah. that we cannot perceive and for them that must have been children and we know that his children also grew up with that faith and that determination as well but you've also mentioned a lot about his his what he would eat and a little bit about kind of how he was living tell us more about that as well and i, th I think you are you f you're not from Qadian, are you i'm not from Qadian. my uh, my wife is from Qadian, okay. so close enough but, but I like to say there. that I like to tell myself that I'm from <laughs> But you've been there, I'm guessing, a few times. A few times, yes. So you've kind of seen the area, yeah. but you've also read about what kind of things he used to wear, what kind of things he used to eat. Uh, what were the rooms like? Was it a palace? He was a prophet. He was technically a, you know, a king. He could have had at some points whatever he wanted well he was from a very royal family and he was that's why he's referred to as the chief of Gadian because okay. at the time he inherited huge amounts of land right but he was never materialistic in fact the promised messiah wasalam, what is known as darul masi mm -hmm. now um, and at that time there was multiple uh, it was quite a big house with many rooms and sitting places and areas but the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, being the simple man that he was when people flocked to him mm. he began giving 
different rooms to different companions from his own from like, his own personal uh, area okay. and uh, Hazrat Maulvi Sahib very beautifully states that the promised Messiah alayhi salatu was salam he doesn't care about properties he doesn't care about materialism in fact he has said many a time that nothing would give me more pleasure than for me to have a home where all of the homes of my companions are surrounding that home okay. and my house is in the middle and I have a door that leads into everybody's home. And the mm -hmm. Promised Messiah says that I, I feel that my home, I don't even consider my home to be my home. My properties, I feel, are the shared wealth of all of my companions. Wow. And essentially, Hazrat Mulvi Sahib says that if you look at his example, he says that the Promised Messiah salatu wasalam, was living in his own home hmm. as if he was a traveler okay. in a small area what do you and everything mean? else. Like, so what he did he have? So it was a huge, Darul Masih is a, is a large place okay. with ample space. Yeah. Um, but the Promised Messiah was practically only living in a few, one or two rooms. Small, a small area for him and his living quarters, a few rooms. And all of the other rooms had been distributed to different companions who were there and the Promised Messiah was hosting them in his own home. Wow. Why? Why did he do this? The only reason you can anybody would do this is because he felt that I have been sent here to guide humanity. And he felt that these people who are coming to me, if I can keep them close and tell them about what Allah has taught me and if yeah. I can show them the signs that Allah has given me, this will create a community that will then spread to the corners of the earth and then spread the message of Allah. So what every so 24 hours a day, constantly, he was engaged in that holy work of God. The Prophet Islam was clearly making a quite a big sacrifice, to be of honest, course, course. for the sake of something so dear to him and something that he was actually commissioned to do. And look, the thing is, Gamar, if, if the promised Messiah, wasalam, God forbid, as some people say, if he was false, hmm. if, if all of this was a show hmm. and it was, a, it was an act, people who are making a fake act they they cherish their secluded moments. They want some time where they can just relax hmm. and take off that fake persona hmm. and just have some time to themselves because it's very difficult to put on a fake act always. Hmm. But you see the promised Messiah wasalam, where every minute of his time is engaged either in worship, in his divine work, or mm -hmm. he's interacting with his companions and talking to them about God and the Messenger of Allah and explaining deep spiritual philosophical things to them and they are asking him questions and he is responding to them. So that in itself is a great proof mm. that the promised Messiah wasalam, was not a fake. He mm -hmm. was not defrauding anybody. In fact, he was the most honest, most truthful, sincere person in the world who Allah the Almighty had appointed and he he believed that with full certainty, which is why he was constantly interacting with people, even in his home, mm. even in his intimate moments when he was alone. Hazrat Maulvi Sahib would be there to see how he was interacting with his children, with people who were coming to get medicine. So that shows how he was really a truthful man. I think we started off, I mean, I personally started off thinking, hey, we're going to talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Islam's human life. But even his human life is testimony to him being a prophet of Absolutely. Allah. As we hear in the Quran as well, that the Prophet وسلم, and other prophets also used their previous life before they were prophets or before they were told they were prophets to show people that, hey, we have been of this nature and character even before our prophethood. And the promised Messiah Islam, was no different. Even when nobody was looking at him, even when nobody was looking towards him, he was doing exactly as you have told us. Uh, a figurehead, a, an example for us in our family, homes, in our lives. And today on the Promised Society Day, I think this is a really fitting way to not only remember him, but this is a practical way that we can really relate to the Promised Society of Islam in some ways. And if there's someone sitting at home and they're a parent or they are, they are even a son themselves or a mother or a father, they can learn from this. Mm. And that's how the Promised Society of Islam can definitely benefit all of us. So Jazakallah Ayaz Bhai for coming down today. Exactly. And Alhamdulillah that it worked like this, that you did translate that book because you were able to impart that knowledge to us in a very unique way. And may Allah enable us to learn from this, Amen. emulate it, and just like the Prophet Muhammad not just say it, but actually do it. Amen. Jazakallah.